Meningitis is a life-threatening disease. If untreated, a patient has 70% chance at dying. Neisseria meningitidis is the main bacteria that causes meningitis. Meningitis is an acute inflammation of the meninges. The meninges are three membranes that cover the entire brain and spinal cord. Neisseria meningitidis is a gram-negative diplococcus. This means it is a round bacteria that typically forms pairs. Besides that, it is covered in a capsule and contains pili. Pili are long hair-like extensions that can interact with the environment. Neisseria meningitidis can only affect humans and it can cause severe damage in the brain and even death. For the rest of the video, we will refer to Neisseria meningitidis as Neisseria. Keep in mind that the proportions in this video are incorrect. In real life, a bacteria is extremely small, even compared to human cells. Neisseria normally can live in someone's nose without causing harm. When a person's immune system is lowered, the bacteria can become pathogenic. To become pathogenic, it first has to overcome several barriers to finally enter the brain. Firstly, the bacteria has to cross the epithelium in the nose. Then it has to cross the vascular endothelium to come into the blood. The blood vessels shown are not anatomically correct. When the bacteria is in the blood, it can travel through the entire body. The body has its own way of getting rid of pathogens and Neisseria can avoid these mechanisms. Neisseria can only develop meningitis when it can enter the brain and cause inflammation there. To get into the brain, there is a difficult signaling pathway. We will discuss each point more in detail separately. About 1 in 10 people have the bacteria Neisseria meningitis in the back of their nose and throat without any signs or symptoms of disease. Neisseria can be present without causing complications, but even then you could infect someone else. The spread of meningococcal bacteria to other people could happen by exchanging spit or saliva. For example, through sneezing, coughing or kissing. Only when the immune system is inefficient or weakens, the bacteria is able to multiply in the nose and throat areas. After, it can transfer to the blood. Therefore, the high-risk groups are babies and children younger than 5 years old, because after birth the immune system is not yet fully developed, teenagers between the age of 14 and 18, because they show more behavior which enhances the chance at obtaining the bacteria, such as kissing multiple people, Besides that, the elderly older than 60 years old because the immune system weakens with age and people of all ages with an immune deficiency. The bacteria passes the epithelium followed by the extracellular matrix and then the endothelium to get into the blood. Researchers suspect passing of the epithelium is done by binding of the bacteria with its pili to a protein on the epithelial cell. This protein is called sacum. This binding stimulates endocytosis of Neisseria into the cell, enabling the passage through the epithelium. How Neisseria passes the other layers is still unknown. Neisseria can evade the immune system in lots of different ways. Complement avoidance is the most effective and most typical for Neisseria meningitis and will be discussed in more detail. The complement system is part of the immune system. It helps with inflammation and it detects pathogens on their cell membrane. To control this system, the body has several regulator proteins, like factor H or C1Q inhibitor. These regulator proteins can inhibit the system to make sure it doesn't overreact. Neisseria uses this mechanism. It expresses factor H binding protein, FHBP in short. This protein recruits factor H. As already mentioned, factor H is an inhibiting protein of the complement system, so when Neisseria is covered in factor H, it cannot be destroyed by the complement system. Another way to evade the immune system is the polysaccharide capsule around the bacteria. This is an extra layer around the bacteria to prevent phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is when the bacteria is being absorbed by immune cells. The capsule prevents insertion of the membrane attack complex, MEC in short. MEC is an effector protein of the complement system to destroy pathogens. 
It is formed with different proteins and together it can create pores in the pathogens. These pores will lead to cell lysis and eventually cell death. The capsule around Neisseria protects the bacteria from insertion of the MAC complex and therefore it can evade the complement system. These are two mechanisms Neisseria uses to evade the immune system. There are a lot more ways Neisseria can evade the immune system, but those will not be discussed in this video. Neisseria expresses lipooligosaccharides, LOS in short. LOS is a lipid which can be bound by immune cells. The binding by immune cells will alarm the immune system of the presence of Neisseria. The immune system will start an immune response to remove the bacteria from the blood. This response is called sepsis and is a deadly condition for the body. However, immune cells can only bind specific conformations, meaning Neisseria is able to escape the immune system by changing the conformation of LOS. The processes used for this purpose are phosphorylation and phosphoethanoaminylation, where respectively phosphates and phosphoethanoamines, PEA in short, are added to change conformation. In this case, the phosphates and the PEAs are added to lipid A, a subunit of LOS. It turns out the level of phosphorylation and phosphoethanoaminylation of lipid A is defining for the occurrence of sepsis. A high level, meaning a lot of conformational change, is correlated with an increased immune tolerance. On the contrary, a low level, meaning little conformational change, is correlated with an increased occurrence of sepsis. Once in the bloodstream, the bacteria travel with the flow and they reach all parts of the body, including the brain. The vessels in the brain are lined with specialized endothelial cells that form a rather tight barrier between the blood and the brain tissue. These cells are more strongly connected to each other through tight junctions and adherence junctions. Furthermore, they express a receptor called the beta-2 adrenergic receptor that in a normal situation is involved in the control of vessel diameter and thus the blood flow under the influence of adrenaline. Another protein that is expressed is called CD147. The combination of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor and CD147 serves as a selective docking site for the passing bacteria. This attachment allows them to arrest on the surface of the endothelium. Attachment occurs through a specific contact with proteins that constitute the pili. This leads to accumulation of Neisseria meningitis on the endothelial surface. Besides that, the attachment starts a series of events that protect the bacteria against the blood flow. Although it is not yet entirely clear, the most likely sequence of events will be described next. Upon binding of the bacteria to CD147, a protein called alpha-actin-4 is recruited from inside the cell towards the cell membrane. The actin filaments thus formed act as a connecting chain that bind both CD147 and the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Now that the receptors are close together, the bacteria can also bind to the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Let's look at the structure of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor and the pili in more detail. Here we see the molecular structure of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor with seven transmembrane helixes. The receptor has extracellular domains outside the cell to bind ligands, and intracellular domains to bind second messengers inside the cell. Next we see the molecular structure of one of the components of the pili. Each section contains a salt bridge which is necessary for the formation of multifunctional polymers. These polymers share conserved hydrophobic and terminal alpha helixes in the filament core. It is unknown which component of the pili binds to which component of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. The binding of the bacterial pilis to the beta-2 adrenergic receptor has the effect of what is called a biased agonist. It does not lead to activation of a GTP binding protein, but the activation of first of all the G-protein coupled receptor kinase. Phosphorylation of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor creates an attractive binding spot for the protein beta-arrestin. Upon binding, beta-arrestin undergoes a conformational change and can now bind and activate another kinase called SRC. One of the domains of SRC, named the SH3 domain, is attracted to a proline-rich region in the beta-arrestin. Now that SRC is attracted, it becomes activated by displacing the SH3 domain that normally keeps the kinase in an incompetent state. 
The SRC activation has two consequences. Nucleation of actin through the wave ARP complex and facilitation of arrangement of actin into cortical actin filaments through phosphorylation of cord actin. Cord actin plays a key role in the formation of villi-like protrusions on the apical side of the cell. These protrusions protect the bacteria from being washed away by the bloodstream and thus promote adhesion and accumulation of Neisseria on the endothelium. Furthermore, beta-arrestin functions as a docking site for several proteins that are components of the cytoskeleton, for instance E-cadherin. By sequestering these adhesion proteins, beta-arrestin prevents their role in maintaining cell-to-cell -cell contact and the endothelial cells detach from each other. Lastly, Neisseria induces cell signaling that promotes the production of MMP8 by the endothelial cells. This cleaving enzyme degrades an essential component of the tight junction called occluding, leaving the tight junction weakened as well. With all of these processes together, the bacteria create circumstances in which it can overcome the endothelium by transendothelial passage. There are three membranes surrounding the brain called meninges. The outer layer is called the dura mater, the middle layer the arachnoid mater, and the inner layer the pia mater. Between these last two layers, there is a place named the subarachnoid space. These three components together form the leptomeninges. Classical bacterial meningitis is most importantly infection of the leptomeninges, with little to no involvement of the dura meter. After passing the blood-brain barrier, Neisseria first enters the subarachnoid space and starts multiplying uncontrollably. Next, the interaction of bacterial components with the meningeal cells initiates the production of cytokines. Cytokines are proteins to activate immune cells, which starts an immune response, thus inflammation. The cytokines involved in leptomeningitis are IL-6, IL-1-beta, and TNF-alpha. Research has shown that the meningeal cells produce a large amount of IL-6 cytokines. This production is mostly stimulated through the binding of pili to the meningeal cells. The other cytokines are secreted by cells present in the subarachnoid space. Neisseria damages the brain, which can lead to permanent damage even after curation. The toxins Neisseria produces cause neuronal apoptosis, meaning cell death of the neurons. Besides that, Neisseria expresses LPS, a lipid comparable to LOS, which causes blood clothing in the vessels of the brain. Furthermore, the response of the immune system against meningitis also leads to neuronal injury. Activation of the immune system leads to recruitment of granulocytes and macrophages. These are immune cells who absorb Neisseria and use lysosomes to break down the bacteria. As the granulocytes and macrophages lyse, the lysosomes will leak into the brain fluid, causing damage to the blood vessels and the brain tissue nearby. The most severe consequence is cerebral oedema. This can be caused by either a shortage of oxygen, an increased volume of brain fluid, an increased vascular permeability, or a combination of all. When someone gets infected with Neisseria meningitis, it is crucial to give them treatment as fast as possible because meningitis can be fatal. Luckily, antibiotics are good treatment options for meningitis. For people with meningitis positive for Neisseria meningitis, the recommended antibiotic is penicillin. But the bacteria can also be resistant to penicillin. In that case, you should use the third generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone or cefotexime. Bacteria are constantly breaking down and rebuilding their cell wall to be able to grow. Penicillin and cephalosporin can kill bacteria by inhibiting the reformation of the cell wall. That way, Neisseria can't grow anymore and will eventually die. There are also vaccines available to prevent meningitis. These vaccines are made from the same bacteria that causes meningitis, but the bacteria is either killed or weakened when transmitted. This way, it is not actually harmful for the body. The body can recognize the bacteria and start an immune response. When exposed to the actual bacteria, the body is then able to recognize the bacteria more efficiently and kill it. In the Netherlands, people are vaccinated at 14 months old and 14 years old. There are different types of Neisseria. Since 2002, babies are vaccinated from menococcal type C. However, since 2018, a new vaccine for menococcal type A, C, 
W and Y is given to babies and teenagers of 14 years old. Now you know the cause of infection and the cause of meningitis. The symptoms are neck stiffness, fever, headache and dark red or purple spots which do not disappear after providing pressure. If you or someone you know is showing signs of meningitis, please consult a doctor. For more information, please look at our references. Thank you for watching.